It is 3 p.m. live from our studio in New York City. I'm Julie Hyman. That's Josh Lipton. This is Yahoo Finance Live. And here's what we're watching this afternoon, a market rally to kick off the final month of trading of 2023. Investors betting the Fed is done cutting rates and is on track to start cutting next year. And fresh comments from Fed Chair Jerome Powell doing little to change their minds. We'll hear from former Fed Governor Randall Crossner straight ahead and get his perspective on the Fed's policy path. And the first deliveries of the Cybertruck not doing a whole lot here for Tesla shares. The automaker under pressure after pricing came in above expectations. And there are questions about who will want to buy the truck and at current production levels. Wait for it. We've got analyst reaction. Plus, we'll hear from Tesla shareholder Ross Gerber. Plus, Pfizer still struggling to find its footing in a post-COVID world. The stock sliding to 2020 levels after a study of its obesity pill showed too many side effects. We have the latest and a look at Pfizer's future ahead. Let's get you up to speed on the market action right now on this Friday. Coming off of a very, very strong month for stocks for the month of November for the three major averages. And as we look at what's going on today, of course, uh, Fed Chair Jay Powell and his commentary, a big focus for investors. And it doesn't seem like they're necessarily listening to what he's saying, right? He didn't, he w is noncommittal as he tends to be about the future path of rate hikes and non-committal about conclusively whether the Fed is done raising rates. But he did seem to indicate that, indeed, they're not going to be raising at the next meeting. That's been fueling some gains in stocks. We also have been watching bond yields that continue to pull back from these levels. And I'm also keeping an eye on the dollar, which is set to fall for its third straight week, uh, going along with what we're seeing in the bond market. Yeah, I think you mentioned, you know, it was Fed head Jay Powell speaking there and kind of saying, listen, I think inflation's on the right track. But he's saying, Wall Street, listen, I am still willing to raise rates if I need to, right? There's kind of a warning there, a sign of caution. But of course, as you noted uh, rightfully there, Julie, Wall Street just kind of shrugged that right off. I mean, I, I, I saw the uh, the strategist Peter Bukvar, who we both know, saying basically Powell tried to push back a little bit. Yes. And that lasted, as Peter said, a few seconds in the treasuries. I mean, Wall Street's basically made up its mind. They're done, they're done hiking. Cuts are in the pipeline. Well, they have bet against him to their detriment before, so we'll see. But let's get another view on this right yeah. now about where the Fed could be going to our top story. Fed Chair Jay Powell speaking earlier today at Spelman College, addressing the health of the economy and the possibility of rate cuts. The FOMC is strongly committed to bringing inflation down to 2% over time and to keeping policy restrictive until we are confident that inflation is on a path to that objective. It would, be, it would be premature to conclude with confidence that we have achieved a sufficiently restrictive stance or to speculate on po when policy might ease. We are prepared to tighten policy further if it becomes appropriate to do so. Joining us now, Chicago Booth Professor and former Federal Reserve Governor Randall Krosner. Randy, it's great to see you. I'm really um, happy to have your perspective on a day like this when we heard from Jay Powell. So he seems to be saying, uh, don't get ahead of yourselves here. And the market has already moved on. Do you think that they're wrong? Do you think that the, how strong is the possibility that the Fed could raise further? So exactly as Jay said, if the data suggests that um, the inflation rate is not coming down, they'll raise rates. The likelihood that that happens in the next few months, I think, is pretty low. So I think it's reasonable that it's to assess they're unlikely to be raising rates. But I think the market tried to hear in there that, oh, and we'll be cutting soon. I didn't hear that at all. And I don't think uh, Jay intended that. I don't think his colleagues intended that at all. I think they they're sort of taking out the, they're reducing the likelihood that they're going to be raising rates, but I think they're going to be holding rates steady for quite some time. And, and Randy, um, just to push on that, you know, billionaire investor uh, Bill Ackman saying he thought the first cut could come as, as soon as the first quarter. You seem to be saying, Randy, you think that's unlikely? I think it's extremely unlikely. Now, of course, if there's some sort of cataclysmic uh, shock that uh, that comes to the U.S. or global economy, they'll, they'll respond. But, uh, but putting that aside, um, 
the 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 key inflation rate that they really focus on is the not the CPI, but something that comes out with the GDP report. It's the Personal Consumption Expenditure Index, the PCE, and not just the overall number, but the so-called core number that takes out the more volatile food and energy sectors. That was just reported at three and a half percent. That's far above their two percent goal. They're getting there. It's coming directly down. But it's going to take a while to get anywhere close to two, and I don't think they're cutting any time um, uh, uh, advance of getting very close to that two percent goal. Randy, what are you watching that shows you that the rate cut, uh, the rate increases, are making their way through the system successfully? I mean, yes, PCE, but in terms of components, what is most important in your mind? You know, are you looking at so-called super core? Or, you know, there's a lot of different ways to parse the data. Yes, everyone has been choosing their their favorite way of uh, taking. You know, what time horizon? You look at three months. Do you look at a year? Do you look at just taking out food and energy, or do you take a food, energy, and shelter? Um, so I think you can look at any of those pieces, and I think you do see a pretty consistent story that inflation is is coming down. You also look at wage growth. That's a very important component because we're a services based economy. The vast majority of, of costs and services uh, and services industries are um, labor related. That also has been uh, been been coming down. So I think those suggest that we're on a good path, but we ain't there yet, and we're not sure how quickly we're going to be able to get from three and a half down to uh, three and a half down to two. And that's why I think it's it would be unwise for the market to say, "Ah, Fed said all clear, and uh, they'll be cutting rates sometime in the next few months." I just don't see that. And Randy, I'm interested also just to get your take on how the, you see the U.S. economy as we head into 2024. I mean, obviously, investors have gotten a lot more comfortable with this, this idea, Randy, that the Fed is going to stick, you know, a soft landing here. This idea, will, it'll, you know, inflation comes back that 2% target without a downturn. Some would say, Randy, that's a, a pretty rare, tricky thing to pull off. Are, are you in the soft landing camp? Uh, I am not. I think that is, uh, as you said, something that we really haven't seen before. I don't. I don't dismiss it. It's. It's certainly possible, and certainly the data have so far been consistent with that. But I think it's. Um, it's going to be tough to to avoid at least uh, a sub substantial slowdown. You know, people talk about a hard landing versus a soft landing. Jay Powell then talked about a softish landing. I talk about a hardish landing. That is one where uh, the economy will slow substantially from where it is. The unemployment rate will move up. But not a severe recession, you know, maybe not a recession at all, or maybe a mild recession. Uh, and I think the reasons for that now rather than before is that finally inflation adjusted inter interest rates have become positive. You know, even as the Fed was raising rates, when inflation was five, six, seven, eight, nine percent, the interest rates were below that. So when you adjust it for, for inflation, that's still a negative real rate. That's a great time to be borrowing when rates are negative. That's no longer the case. Also, wage growth has finally started to catch up with inflation and is now above inflation. So when real wage growth, that is the inflation adjusted wage growth, was negative, uh, that's a great time for firms to be hiring. Labor is cheap relative to the prices that they can, uh, they can get for their outputs. Now, wage growth is above the inflation rate, and so that means it's much more costly to hire laborers. And so I think that's why you're going to start to see um, a slowdown in the labor market. Randy, I also wanted to ask you sort of about the, the mechanics, if you will, of debt in the United States, because obviously that feeds also into what the Fed does, you know, fis on the fiscal side, what the U.S. government is doing as well. There's a lot of talk that there is perhaps less demand for Treasuries right now. So what is that going to do to the ability of rates to come down, but also just sort of to the to the concerns over the amount of U.S. debt and the ability of the U.S. to sell its debt? I think right now it's not a problem. As you can see, people are buying a lot of the, the debt. That's why um, interest rates have been coming down, because the, 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 price of, uh, the price of the bonds is going up, the interest rates coming down. But at least right now, there's enough demand. But I think there is a concern going forward, because Debt is very high. Deficits are uh, are uh, are much higher than they have been uh, last year or so, and so that suggests there's going to be a lot of demand by the government to uh, to find people who can um, uh, who can finance the uh, the deficit, and so I think that will be a problem over time. I think right now it's not a challenge. Randy Croster, thank you so much for joining us today, Randy. Appreciate that time. Bye bye. 
Let's turn now to some of today's trending tickers. We're going to start with Pfizer's shares, and they are taking a hit here. This comes after the company says it will stop developing its twice-daily version of its experimental weight loss drug, drug maker noting high rates of side effects in a mid-stage study. And you can see the shares down nearly 6%. You know, we talk a lot about the mania in AI, Julie. There is kind of mania in weight loss drugs mm -hmm, as mm -hmm. well we've been seeing. And listen, you can understand why. You see um, there's a lot of money potentially on the table. You look at kind of the investor reaction to Eli Lilly and Novo Nordisk. But I think this Pfizer news also kind of speaks to some of the potential risks and challenges here too. Yeah, and I think the stakes are high for Pfizer, right? Uh, just yep. to take a step back, this is a company that obviously did enormously well during the pandemic because of its vaccine. Now the demand for that vaccine is falling off quicker than anticipated and the company has had to cut its outlook as a result. Um, all along, even during the pandemic in the background, Pfizer was also concentrating on cancer drugs. That's something it's ramping back up. Mm -hmm. But then weight loss drugs were perhaps going to be another source of its next phase. Does this count that out? No, by no means, but it is at least a delay to that, that this particular drug seems to have those adverse side effects that right now means it's not going to move forward as quickly. Now, a, a, a comment from Cowan stood out to me, Steve Scala over there, who said this is a worse than anticipated outcome for a program that was already playing catch up. So, you know, the idea that they're behind and now that this particular study didn't work out is, you know, that's why we're seeing a neg that negative uh, reaction. Yes, yeah, so, listen, stock down today and down about now 40% this year. Yeah, exactly. So people were counting on this and they're disappointed. So we'll see what the next stage is. Uh, also, let's look at Paramount and Apple. They're reportedly in talks to bundle their streaming services at a discount. That's according to the Wall Street Journal, which says the discussions are in their early stages and it's unclear what shape a bundle could take. This whole thing with bundling, yeah. it just cracks me up every time because it's like everybody wants to cut the cord. They want to get rid of cable. Oh, but here it's, it's not cable. It's not a suite of channels. It's a bundle. <laughs> so, you know, it's just a, a different sort of package for the same thing. Obviously, it's a lower price package than a cable subscription would be. But nonetheless, not surprising to see the slowdown in streaming. And therefore, some of these companies start to talk about teaming up in this way. Yeah, I mean, there, there's so many streaming services. Yes. It's hard. And so you don't, you're not surprised when you see a headline about consolidation. Now, consolidation isn't going to be a company buying another company. Right. Not right. with this FTC. That's not going to happen. <laughs> so this kind of consolidation, I can get it. I can understand the strategy. You combine it. You make it, according to Wall Street Journal, which had this report, you would make it cheaper. That could make sense, you know, especially against this mm -hmm. backdrop, more cost-conscious consumer kind of cut back on churn there and these two in particular you can see because I mean you think about Apple Julie you know it's not playing like the Netflix game it's very different it's not doing yes. the big library it's you know Tim Cook is very much focused on get smaller more focused premium high quality so it, it kind of struck me when I saw the headline I could I could see the strategy I could see how it could make sense yes and and one of the driving reasons behind this at least according to the journal which cites some data that says uh, churn that is customers leaving the platforms for both Apple TV plus and Paramount plus was more than seven percent in yeah, October so that which makes is sense. higher than the industry average now will this reverse that churn yeah, I guess we'll have to I mean, wait that, for you know, more I, numbers. Yeah, I mean, certainly you would think of one real advantage there potentially is combine, try to reduce that churn, try to keep people loyal. Yeah, yep. we'll see. All right, lastly, let's check out shares of Alibaba. They are edging lower. It's after Morgan Stanley downgraded that stock to equal weight from overweight. Firm also cutting its price target, noting a slower than expected uh, fundamental turnaround here. So Morgan Stanley, uh, not a fan, go to equal weight. So the equivalent there of a whole, the target goes to 90. And the analyst did talk about this turnaround and kind of slow going. They, of course, decide against spinning off that cloud business, Julie. Mm -hmm. So Morgan Stanley also emphasized that, saying that brings, in their words, kind of uncertainty to the value unlocking from, from reorganization. Just as interesting, by the way, though, is what the analysts do list as what they like. They named yes. PDD as their top pick in that China e-commerce market. Yeah, that really stood out to me. You've got Alibaba shares trading at a 12-month uh, low. 
And you've got PDD, newly ascendant, right, with its popularity of its Timu uh, site. And yesterday, um, Alibaba's market cap actually fell below that, that yep. of PDD. So now it's interesting to have this Morgan Stanley call, which says that they expect PDD to continue to gain market share um, in China. So, you know, you really have kind of a, a battle between these two companies at this point, not just in the market itself, but in investors' minds as well, if they're not going to buy the basket, if they're trying to figure out which to buy, PDD has gotten a lot more popular. Yeah, we should know Morgan Stanley is a bit of an outlier. It doesn't mean, of course, that they're wrong. But most brokers, it's interesting, still do like Baba here. 44 mm. buys, eight holds, no sells. Interesting stuff. Yeah. We're just getting started here on Yahoo Finance Live. Coming up, stocks trading higher today, building on the recent end of year rally. We're going to tell you if that might continue into December. Also, Panera Bread reportedly filing paperwork for an IPO. We'll give you those details. And Tesla's Cybertruck is here. It does come with a hefty price tag. What will the demand picture look like? And will it actually matter for the stock? We'll have all that and more when Yahoo Finance returns. Tesla's long-awaited Cybertruck is here, but it is a little pricier than many expected. The lower-end model coming in around 61000 The higher-end Cyber Beast has a whopping $100,000 price tag. Our next guest says cost should dramatically limit the pool of buyers. Here with more now is Ronald Jessikow, who is Guggenheim Securities Vice President of Automotive Equity Research. It's great to see you again, Ron. So 
Um, what was the most important thing that we learned yesterday about the Cybertruck and how it's going to inform what it means to Tesla? Yeah, I think the most important detail coming out of the event and what investors were were largely focused on was was pricing. Um, we had an idea that range wasn't going to live up to the initial promises or messaging or whatever the the right language is from the company, but but pricing was was a key debate coming in. I know some thought we could have a vehicle still in the fifty thousand dollar range, um, but ultimately the the vehicles that are being delivered next year eighty thousand dollars plus is probably a a much smaller market than what we what investors initially thought Tesla was attacking here. And then I think looking at the specs and the size of the vehicle range, things like that, you're probably not left with people buying this for commercial reasons. And it's ultimately more of an enthusiast vehicle, which isn't trivial, but if you think about the Model X for Tesla, it, it sells about 25,000 units a year in the US. Um, I think that's probably a more appropriate steady state TAM for the the Cybertruck as well, if you just look at the two high trim vehicles at least. And so Ron, so bottom line for you, for investors who are listening right now, you see this as remaining kind of, Ron, more of a niche product. It's not in your opinion going to be something that really financially moves the needle? Exactly. I think the Cybertruck in isolation doesn't move the needle. I think what, what could emerge from the Cybertruck is some of the technology they've developed within the vehicle being applied to a mass market vehicle in the future. So the one thing they highlighted was steer by wire, genuinely very innovative technology. To the extent they can scale that down into future vehicles, it, you can change the form factor of a vehicle, you can dramatically improve efficiency of a vehicle. Um, and I think that is that is what could emerge from this on the positive side. But I think the Cybertruck in isolation is, is an immaterial part of the Tesla story. I think they've made that pretty clear in recent months with their messaging. And I would just note even, even the website's only geared for US, Mexico and, and Canada. So I don't, I don't think they're expecting to go beyond that either. And Ron though, I want to ask you, do, do you think though, you've heard some, some folks talk about this, that it, you think of the truck they say is more of a, of a halo product, Ron, you know, that's going to kind of reinvigorate a brand that some argue, you know, perhaps slipped a little bit um, for the lack of new models and that really perhaps a cyber truck at the very least to get people talking about Tesla could even motivate them to go out and buy the three and the Y. What do you, what do you think of that argument? Yeah, you never, never say never, but I think if you look at the current EV buyer, they're actually pretty pragmatic. That's why the Model 3 and Model Y have done so well, is they offer a great value to the consumer for the price you pay. I don't, I don't think this this halo effect is, is, is really grounded in reality. I think the Model 3 and Y have done well because of the value they offer. And I, I think that the Cybertruck is, is a bit more of a sideshow relative to a, a halo effect. So Ron, let's talk about the main event for just a second because you have a sell rating on the stock. We've talked to you about it before. Is there any scenario in 2024 um, where they would do better than you expect? What would have to go right for Tesla for them to perform better than what your sell rating implies? Yeah, I think interest rates obviously would help. If they continue to back off, that has been a, a pressure point for pricing and on the consumer. Uh, I think as we look at units for next year, we're at 2.1 million units, so call it mid to high teens unit growth off of the 2023 base. And recent trends would suggest they're going to have to cut price even to deliver 2.1 million units. And then you're left with flat to down earnings growth in 2024, just kind of dropping through the entire growth algo. So I really I really think it's it's FSD, it's something else. It's not it's not the vehicle part of the business because even the company has has messaged that we're kind of in this growth air pocket for the next several years with with no new models of of significance until the model two. All right, Ron, thank you so much for your time today. We appreciate it as always. Thank you very much. The Cybertruck delivery event uh, failing to boost Tesla stock as pricing for the EV came in higher 
than initially promised. This has questions to loom, of course, for investors, not only over cyber truck production, but also on the EV giant CEO, Elon Musk. Here to discuss all that is Ross Gerber, CEO and president of Gerber Kawasaki Wealth and Man Investment Management, as well as, of course, an investor in Tesla. Ron, it's great to see you. Um, listen, you are a shareholder. You were listening to the event, I would imagine, yesterday. Give us your takeaways. What'd you make of it? Well, I, I mean, the event was a pretty typical Tesla event with lots of lights and, you know, excitement. And, you know, it's a very exciting time for Tesla releasing such an advanced, incredible vehicle. I don't think the pricing is relevant because I think they can't make a lot of these vehicles in the short term and people will pay $100,000 for it, including me. So I think just the coolness factor, the tech, you know, they can easily sell out the cars they have for the next two years. But that doesn't actually have a huge material impact on Tesla's earnings or, or you know, overall financial position, um, which I think, you know, it will take years, obviously, for this to have a positive impact. But we do expect pricing to come down as they scale. And that's been the case with every vehicle they've made. OK, so I just want to linger on something you said. You are going to buy one of these things? Because I thought you were sort of on yeah. the fence about this. No, not the Cybertruck. What I said earlier this week is I'm getting rid of my, my wife's Model Y for a Rivian, and I'm going to get rid of my Plaid for a Cybertruck. You know, the the Plaid I only bought because I was wait, waiting for the Roadster, and I, I like the Plaid, but it's, the, it's just like a lot of the issue I have with Tesla right now is the models haven't been refreshed for a long time. So I'm excited for the Model 3 Highland to get to the United States, but the Model Y and the Model S and X really need some upgrades as well. And I think that's what Cybertruck is foreshadowing is the new technology that will be in the upgrades for the next cycle of Tesla's over the next five years. And Ross, um, I just want to follow up on that. What, what excites you about the truck though? What capabilities have you enthusiastic about it? And I have to ask you, are you going for, for base here, Ross, or the Cyber Beast? Which one no, you No, I'm for? going for the Cyber Beast 100%, but <laughs> you know, I, you know, I've never been shot at before, you know, in my car. So those features are less appealing to me. But, uh, you know, um, I think for me, I like driving the most advanced, fastest, coolest vehicle I can get my hands on. You know, I just love cars. I love technology. And, and Tesla was always attractive to me because it was the merger of cars and technology, you know, so for me to get my hands on such a fast, large vehicle with such amazing technology, you know, like that's really exciting to me. Uh, I, I'm not a typical consumer though. And and so I think for the typical consumer or the typical truck buyer, obviously this is outside their budget. And I think that's what analysts are talking about, but I don't think this vehicle was made for them at this point. And it is an enthusiast vehicle. And, and, and I think that is what it is, but I don't think it's hard to sell 250,000 of these a year if they can make them. I think the challenge is going to be actually making them, not selling them. Right. There's definitely been some reporting to that effect. Okay. So let's take a step back from the Cybertruck for just a second, Ross, because, and I don't know if people are not shooting at you in your car or throwing things at you, but no, I don't know if you continue to say negative stuff about Elon or criticize Elon, maybe, maybe they're, come, they're coming for you. I don't know. Hopefully not. not maybe not just, where I live. just not online, where I live. just online, maybe. Um, people but, don't like Elon where I live. Remember, I live in California. Right. He's probably the most despised person in, I've seen in a long time. You know, it's, it's depressing to me because I like Elon. But the truth of the matter where I live, people love what I'm saying. You know. Well, I, I want to dig into this a little bit more, especially given what's happened this week, right? And obviously, the comments that he made at the Deal Book Summit that got the most attention were about his other, one of his other businesses, X. But, you know, it always comes back to this is the guy who's running these enormously powerful companies and at times seems to not really have it together. I'll say that diplomatically. So, how much does that concern you as an investor? Well, there's two things that concern me in this part of this discussion. First is we spent a lot of time this week talking about what he said in Dealbook instead of Cybertruck. And it took a lot away from the Tesla event. I'm, I'm sorry. It, it's sad to be that everybody's talking about, you know, him cursing out advertisers versus the Cybertruck, which is really the story. It's an incredible piece of technology. So in a way, it's like sad to me. You know, the second side of the story as a Tesla investor, this isn't good for Tesla. 
There's no question it's affecting people's purchasing decisions. They're lowering prices. They're giving away charging. They're going to have to do more and more and more of this. We're in a highly polarized world today. And many of the things that us public figures say is, you know, highly parsed by our customers, including everything I say by my customers. And, and you know, we have to be very careful if we don't want to hurt our businesses and express ourselves freely. And Elon's not doing a good job of that and it's hurting Tesla. And, and that's what I've expressed. I, I really think, you know, it's unfortunate that his investment with X is such a conflict of interest for Tesla shareholders, but there's no doubt in my mind that it's hurting Tesla. So what should be done about it? Should he, I mean, you know, he's, he found another CEO for X. That doesn't seem to have helped. Does somebody else need to be running Tesla more day to day? I mean, you know, he's not going to be quiet. That's, that doesn't seem right. to be the remedy here. So what's the remedy? Well, tes Tesla, you know, Elon's not a collaborator, so he's not going to have, you know, some sort of COO, CEO partnership. Like, for example, I do with my partner or many companies have, you know, I don't think, I, I don't know who would run Tesla under the conditions that Elon would want and with the team that he has. And the best chance they had was Zach Kirkhorn, who's, who's now gone. So, you know, this is my concern with Tesla is secession planning. I mean, it's Elon's company. It's basically like a private company. The board isn't going to do anything for the benefit of shareholders. So, you know, quite frankly, I think Tesla shareholders need to assess that, that we're on this boat and, and we have no control of the boat. And the guy piloting the boat has a lot of other boats. And that's just a fact. It is just a fact. Now, as of the last filing that I saw, Ross, you guys still had almost, what, 400,000 shares, something like that. You guys are shareholders. Are you considering trimming it all because of all of this? Well, we've been trimming our Tesla position over the last six months, mostly relevant to our allocation more than the actual ownership. You know, we want to own Tesla for the long term. We, we believe in the company and I, I'm a long term shareholder in Tesla, but it was our largest. It is still our, actually our largest individual stock position. It represents a huge amount of assets for many of my clients and many of which are older too, you know, so, and, and we've made a hundred times our money on Tesla. This is unheard of in the investment world, you know, like making a hundred times your money. So for us, like, it just makes sense to take profits over time for, for clients relative to their individual situation. But as a whole, as a firm, Tesla's a top five position at our firm and in my ETF GK I, I think it's one of the most innovative technology companies in the world, and it's working on some of the most important technologies for what we invest in in climate. And so Tesla's going to remain a top holding in our fund, you know, either way. And, you know, I'm a supporter of, you know, the mission of Tesla. Um, and one final question for you on another company, because um, Ford, uh, the CEO there, Jim Farley, tweeting today about the record month that Ford had for F-150 Lightning sales for October. Um, you guys, I believe, had some Ford shares at one point. Uh, I don't believe you have them anymore. But, you know, even though their de demand seems to be falling overall for EV vehicle EVs, is there an opportunity here for some of Tesla's competitors to step up? We're not Ford shareholders and, and we haven't been, you know, as a firm for many reasons, although I like Jim Farley and I like what he's doing. Um, I think the EV players are suffering from bad charging solutions that's now being alleviated by everybody moving to the Tesla charging standard. Most people who've bought other EVs like Fords or, or the Volkswagens have problems with the charging when they're, you know, going to destinations. And, and that's been a big issue. So I think with Rivian and Ford and all the companies moving to the Tesla charging standard next year, this will be a huge plus for the other EV players. It's actually one of the biggest moats Tesla has is the supercharging network, and they're opening that up to the competitors. So this is a, a huge boon for the competitors of Tesla, actually, um, although it's great for EV adoption. So I, 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 I like the Ford vehicles. I think they're priced right, and I think the next wave of 
EVs are trucks, whether it be Rivian and Tesla, which have expensive trucks, or Ford, which has a much more affordable truck. And, and, and I think it's great. You know, the Lightning's a great vehicle for the money. So, so I think as we move forward, I think people want EVs. People don't want to pay for gas. I think this nonsense that EV sales are slowing or whatever is more company related and product related, but consumers want EVs and, and we expect this demand to can continue to increase over time. All right. Well, well we're going to keep in touch, check back in with you when you get your cyber truck and switch up yeah. your vehicles. Good to catch up with you, Ross. Really appreciate your perspective. Yeah, thanks for having me. Coming up, stocks trading higher today, building on the recent end of year rally. We're going to tell you if that'll continue in December after the break. Markets kick off the first trading day for the month of December with gains here for what might be in store for major averages. In the last stretch of the year, we have Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery. Jared. Thank you, Josh. Well, read the headline here. Stocks tend to rally in December, and really it's in the back half of the month. That's when trading really slows down and uh, people just kind of settle into the holidays. Until then, might get a few bumps. And by the way, this is only what happens on average going all the way back to 1950. But of course, our results can uh, vary here. And let's just keep in mind that we had a tremendous November. So more on that in a second. But I just want to show what on average and what on median happens with the second 
quarter returns for the large cap sphere in the month of December. Uh, the number one median is communication services. A little footnote there, it's only been in existence for a few years, but it does have Alphabet and also Meta. It also has Verizon, Netflix, a bunch of different disparate tickers. Uh, but that is, for what it's worth, number one, at least in terms of the median return, uh, over 2%. Then you have consumer discretionary. I think not surprising because that is a retail-oriented sector. Sector People are thinking about the holidays, and the retailers are all too eager to release the results, I guess, if they're good. Then we have financials, healthcare, and energy. Now, healthcare and energy, arguably a little bit defensive. Financials, interesting that they would be doing well. But if we take a look at the second page, that's when the results tend to drop off. Uh, utilities, consumer staples, that's also retail, but materials and industrials, all of those averages and medians are positive. But then we start getting in a negative territory for tech. Tech has uh, an average, uh, I guess over the years, averaging down about 1% and real estate about half of that. I would note that the median returns are positive, but if we think about all the outsized returns we've had, this year, and especially concentrated in tech, this is what's happened only in the last month in my leader sphere. Look at ARC up 36%, meme stocks up 26%. Are we gonna get a repeat of that going forward? Probably not. Uh, arguably, a lot of demand for the Santa Claus rally has been pulled forward and maybe it's exhausted itself. But I wanna leave you with this. This is the bulls and are surging as the bears retreat. This is the AAII bull, uh, bull bear survey results. And the bulls are at the upper limit. The bears are at the lower limit. We have not seen a spread this wide in forever. So another sentiment indicator, maybe things got just a little bit too bullish in the month of November. Hmm, so we'll see how, if it swings back in December. Thanks yes. so much, Jared, appreciate it. Well, investors not seeming to believe Fed Chair Jay Powell's comments that it is premature to be thinking about rate cuts. Joining us now, Rockland Trust Director of Research, Doug Butler. As always, Doug, investors try to look ahead. They try to discount what they think is going to happen. And at the moment, the narrative seems to be those rate cuts are happening, <laughs> maybe midway through next year. What do you think? Uh, I think that I'm with probably the 25% of the street that thinks that rate cuts will happen, but probably not until the end of the year. Um, I, I think an awful lot of people have discounted the fact that there's no more raises coming. I could still see a scenario in which, again, as we get head closer and closer to this soft landing, they might not. They might want to raise rates one more, one last time. I wouldn't bet on the cuts just yet. And so, Doug, um, give me that backdrop. What, what's your view of the equity market here, Doug? You know, you think this rally continues, and and what does twenty twenty four look like? I, I think you know. I think we always go into it thinking well, we're hoping to get ten percent. And you know, what do we think? Do, you, do we think that the market ends around five thousand next year? Sure, that seems like a reasonable place for a tent. I don't think the ride's going to be that smooth, though. I think we could end the year next year at 5,000, up 10% or so from here. But my guess is we have some sort of 20 to 30% pullback at some point. By the way, could happen after, you know, after we hit 5,000 in March, then we get the 20% pullback. But I do think that we're we're set up, especially that last segment where you showed the spread between bullish sentiment and bearish sentiment. I think when it's that wide, you know, you might want to start getting your helmets on. Yeah. Uh, so where should people be putting their helmets on, metaphorically, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. No, yeah. What, what look? look we, defense is that what it looks like right now? Well, we are we're underweight in the consumer discretionary in the tech space, and that's largely because we essentially weighed a lot of it based on earnings, and so the earnings for those sectors are disproportionate. The multiples for them are disproportionately high. So we generally are underweight in those sectors. Um, so the, but I think for we but we're biased towards defensives and towards high quality and low volatility. Two names that have popped up uh, for us, Accenture. Accenture is a really interesting name in that they're a tertiary beneficiary of this move to AI. They're, they're probably the best suited to help business clients move to the cloud and to more of these AI-architected software. Um, so we think that they're well-positioned. 
And then in terms of defensives, we like Verizon. Um, we've, we've unfortunately liked it for quite a while, but we like it here, particularly we think they're getting their turnaround in place. They've improved their free cash flow a lot. They've been able to um, really grow this fixed wireless access business, sort of 5G in the home. Um, we think that that has some competitive advantages over the cable companies. What about, Doug, when you look at the fixed income space, do you see opportunities there at all, treasuries, munis, corporates? Well, the nice part is, is now we've got some yield. So then now there's some benefit. Uh, the high yield spreads are pretty tight, so we probably err on being very high quality in our fixed income space. We think every client should have some high yield, but we wouldn't, we wouldn't stretch for yield here. Uh, one of the other things is that it's the the fact that the tenure has come down. So essentially, it's now midway between where it was last month and last year. So it's above where it was last year, but at, at in the in the lower mid fours is much better than five percent at the uh, at the end of the at the end of last month, at the end of October, Halloween rates. So it's nice that they've come down. As those come down, you'll start to see, you possibly will see mortgage rates tick down, which will maybe improve a bit of affordability as we don't seem to see any real weakness in the housing sector and certainly not, not on the rental side just yet. Doug Butler, thank you so much for joining us today, Doug, and have a great weekend. You too, bye-bye. And coming up, more IPOs. Panera Bread's parent company reportedly filing confidentially for an IPO. We're going to break that down next.
Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. All right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Mester Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there's more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance. Yet another IPO on the potential docket. We're talking about fast casual restaurant Panera Brands. It's reportedly filed con confidentially for an IPO. That's according to the Financial Times. This is something that has been long awaited. It's a, controlled by JAB Holding, um, and Panera has kind of gone in and out of public life, mm -hmm. right? The uh, company that uh, co-founder of Panera, Ron Shaikh, is now chairman of Kava, was one of the few companies that did go public this year. So this is something that was one of the ones that was sort of buzzed about. Yeah, and it was interesting, you know, we had Greg Martin from Rainmaker on this mm -hmm. week on the show, who's kind of the perfect guy to talk to about this, obviously. And we were, just more broadly, we we're kind of saying, we asked Greg, you know, listen, you've seen this IPO trickle. Do you think, Greg, this could turn into kind of a flood next year? I thought, Julie, when he spoke to us, he sounded kind of optimistic. I mean, when I listened to Greg, he was saying, listen, rates are stabilizing. Maybe we, re we really do st stick this soft landing. Granted, there's some you know, debate about that. But if, if that was the case, that would be good news for the equity market, Greg was saying, and good news for the IPO market. You know, I, he, seemed, he, seemed, he thought that the environment was starting to look more positive here, maybe signaling a reopening. Right. And we talked about the false start that we had in 2023 because we were having the same conversation. Yep. At the beginning of this year, with the companies that were expected to come public, led in size-wise, at least by Arm Holdings, all of that happened, and yet we didn't really see the performance from those stocks. And as Greg talked about, the broader macro environment is certainly a factor there. So those that we put up on the screen, including Panera, but also Skims and Shein and Reddit and Rubrik, the ones that we're now talking about, likely what's going to be really important is how they are priced and right. how they are valued. Right. And even if the broader environment is improving, if they are priced too high, yeah. then that could still prove to be sort of detrimental, detrimental for sentiment for further IPOs. I, yeah, I think what Greg, exactly your point, what Greg said, he thought, you're, listen, you're going to see some high quality names take the plunge depending on their performance and investor demand. You know, maybe the floodgates open a bit here. In terms of tie lot, timeline, he was saying, listen, he thinks you're, you know, one to two quarters out. But it was interesting. I thought just here's comments. I thought just generally kind of more positive. Mm -hmm. yep. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. All right, some of the top trades of this year involve the Magnificent Seven, and Bank of America says they could be the top names to watch next year, too, but not in the way you might think. Madison Mills is here with the details. Well, it's exactly what you were sort of just talking about uh, with these high valuations, right? Some of these big names like a Hartnett from B of A are talking about looking outside of the Magnificent Seven, but to some names that are tech adjacent, right? So he specifically talks about going long on distressed tech. If you look at the S&P Biotech ETF, for example, ticker XBI, uh, he says that this example here tends to move opposite uh, to rates. So that could be attractive as we are anticipating those rate cuts moving forward. We're also seeing low valuations in some of those biotech names, uh, which obviously is in very stark contrast to the valuations we're seeing in those top seven names that we talk about all the time. Uh, but I do want to kind of contextualize this call from Hartnett because uh, those seven S&P 
S&P 500 top names there, gaining 71% this year. The other 493 stocks adding only 6% to the overall index. So I guess if you want to make an argument for more of a bull market next year, you kind of have to believe right. that some of these other tech names are going to grow. Okay, so you mentioned biotech. Is there anything else that he sort of zooms in on as potentially being winners here? He talks about investment grade bonds for hmm. some of these tech companies. He says it's a way for you to own the balance sheet of those companies rather than just owning the stock itself. And also talks about it as a potential hedge against any sort of hmm. hard landing. It's a different way to get in on the tech play. Uh, he also talks about sort of a blend of bond investment. He's bullish on 30-year treasury bonds mixed with investment grade bonds. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. It also raised this question to me of whether this stock bond portfolio relationship that we always talk about is starting to shift a little bit with the 60-40 portfolio. Yeah, it's also interesting because in the past when we would have this like corporate bond conversation, there were very few ways for retail investors short of calling a broker to get in on it. Yeah. But now there are ETFs that sort of wrap some of that corporate debt that are, you know, and some of them are actively managed. So it's kind of an interesting time on that front. Yeah. Anything to the note, May, that you saw that really surprised you? You know, I thought it was interesting that they were brave enough to talk about the Magnificent Seven as a play that's not going to continue moving forward, particularly given that Savita Submarinian still sees the S&P 500 target from B of A hitting 5,000 next year. I'm curious about how they square those two arguments. How are we going to see the S&P have that much growth if it's going to be outside of these big seven names? Is it going to be distressed tech, like he's saying here, going long on distressed tech? I don't know. I don't know that we've seen great evidence of that, but I'm also not, you know, working at these banks. I just get to talk about it, so I have an easier <laughs> job here. Brave, or we'll see if it yeah. still looks brave at the end of the year. Exactly. <laughs> Maddie, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Coming up, we've got the closing bell on Wall Street. We'll be checking on the latest market moves and the top trending tickers. Stay tuned.
We're just minutes away from the closing bell on Wall Street. Let's take a look at today's action. Josh, as we've been talking about all day, we saw this sort of move upward, mm. as we heard from Jay Powell. He seemed sort yeah. of optimistic about a soft landing, but still said, you know, we might still need to raise rates. But the market took it as good news. Yeah, Jay Powell comes out and says, I like where inflation's headed. We're going the right direction. But I'm serious. I will raise if I, I have to. I will turn this car around. I'm serious, kids. <laughs> and Wall Street just shrugs it right yeah, off. They're exactly. convinced. They're convinced he's done and cuts are coming. Yeah, so that's how it played out with stocks, right? We saw strength for the three major averages. We also, of course, have to look at how it played out in the bond market because we see this continued yeah. pretty sizable pullback, right? Like right. 13 basis points is a pretty big move when you're talking about what's going on here. And so now if you look at like the one month uh, for bonds, you see that big pullback. Of course, if you look at a six month view, it looks even more dramatic here, that drop that we've had in yields. And then I wanted a quick word on the US dollar as well, because there it's not been as dramatic as it's been in the bond market. Mm -hmm. But still, you've had a lot of what I think were something like three consecutive weeks where yep. we've seen the dollar fall here on For the sure. same view that rates are coming down. Yep. All right, we got the closing bell there on Wall Street. It looks like Janice Henderson is bringing the close here on this Friday and first day of the new trading month, coming off a pretty monster month in the month of November for the major averages here. Uh, just looking at some of the stats here that our friend Jared Blickery is sending us. The highest close of the year for the S&P 500. For the Dow, it's the highest since uh, January 12th of 2022. So really some big moves here. The Dow now higher for four straight trading days. Um, real estate has been having a big rebound here as rates have been coming down. That's one of the interest rate sensitive sectors. And so that's one that has been benefiting here. One of the other interesting stats that he has just sent us, Starbucks, mm. trading lower for 10 straight sessions. Really? Yes. Do Inter we have a headline on that or no? I, I don't have a headline on it. That was, no. just, that was just one that stuck just out to me. That I mean, obviously, there's been union stuff simmering, but that hasn't yep. really affected the stock uh, before now. You have China stuff simmering in the effect on uh, the company, but 10 straight and sessions. And now, by the way, dead the flat on the year, basically. Very interesting. Yeah. We're going to keep watching that Thank one. Thank you, and Jared. Maybe we'll talk a little yeah. bit more about it next week or something. All right, let's take a look at some trending tickers now. Fisker trimming its production guidance in order to prioritize liquidity as part of the list of business updates released by the auto company. So this one was interesting. Um, Fisker, a nice pop today, of mm -hmm. course. Listen, we put that in context. This stock has been hammered, Julie. But the news is that the EV startup, they're going to sharpen their focus on operation, their, their, their words. Business update, we're getting here, they reduced Dece December production to prioritize liquidity. They say to unlock over 300 million of working capital. Also adjusting production guidance to just over 10,000 units for 2023. And they say they are in advanced stages, Julie, of discussions with several automakers for a strategic partnership. So yeah, a nice pop yeah. today. And one of the other things apparently they're talking about with major automakers is to sell their greenhouse gas emission that, yeah. credits, which is also um, interesting there and presumably another reason the stock went up. But to your point, I mean, the context here is really important. The stock is down more than 90% yeah, it's... from its record high where it was in early 2021. This was a de-SPAC. That's how it came public. There was SPAC combination. And just to remind our viewers, SPACs, when they start trading, start trading at 10. So that's sort of the reference price that you can think about when you think about SPACs, although some of them go much higher and then come much lower. So Fisker, even though it's up a lot today, is trading at a dollar. 72. So yeah. that just tells you kind of about where we have come. Down about 75% this year, to your point. Yeah. And you just pull back the chart. Look at that from the record in 2021, not pretty. Yes. Let's talk about another mover today. That was Norfolk Southern, the stock getting a boost after Bank of America upgraded it to buy from neutral. The analysts are saying that progress on service and volume recapture has been happening here uh, for the company, um, that car loads are trending above target, that they're doing well uh, year to date, that sequential service uh, has now been outperforming. And um, they, the analysts that is over Bank of America are going to be meeting with Norfolk Southern next week in Atlanta. 
and they're going to be gathering some more information at that point. Yeah, it was interesting. They, the analysts saying they have shown, they, the company, has shown faster service gains than mm -hmm. they expected after those two network outages, including, you know, that derailment, of course, earlier this year, Julie, in East Palestine, Ohio. The frequency of incidents has caused us increasing concern, they tell their clients, yet the, st the speed of improvements suggest improved resiliency, they say, and they take their target to 248. Yeah, and I mean, to your point, this was a company that had a lot of troubles because of that derailment. The stock is still down about 10% year to date as they have sort of struggled to come back from this. Uh, but at the same time, uh, analysts are still not entirely convinced. There are 16 buys and 15 holds. Yeah. So it still looks like the, the folks are kind of split as to whether they can come back. But call uh, Bank of America now in that buy camp. And UiPath shares, those are skyrocketing after the company topped estimates on the top and bottom line in the third quarter. The automation software company also reporting an upbeat outlook for annual recurring revenue in the street really seem to be um, reassured by all of these numbers here. And that's why we saw it um, really shoot higher here. It's had a pretty good year to date for the company. Um, and analysts are saying that expectations weren't necessarily high coming into this. So that accounts for some of that outsized reaction. You know, one, one uh, Evercore's Kirk Matern mm -hmm. weighed into, and Kirk is a very smart guy, covers the enterprise, said the results are strong, upbeat outlook, says the company's executing well in what Kirk called a choppy macro environment, says the next leg higher, he told his clients, is gonna depend on the 2025 guidance. And just looking at his rating here, he's in line on the stock. So on the sidelines, though, he did he did raise his target to 24. Yeah, a couple other things I just wanted to mention here. I was just quickly looking at the short interest on the stock, which looks like it's, it's around 10% afloat, kind of high-ish. So you do wonder if there's a short squeeze yep. element to that big outsized gain here today. And the other thing I wanted to mention is, as I said, the stock is higher year to date. It's about doubled. But if you look at the five-year chart of this thing, it is a very different story. It is down sharply over the past five years. So this year has been a bit of a comeback story. I'm just gonna quickly look up the five-year number here. Over the past five years, it's down more than 50%. Yep. So, you know, context is important. For sure. <laughs> All right, moving on, Boeing is poised to have its first up year in four, and it's one of the best performers in the Dow. Analysts have gotten more bullish of late, the stock picking up three upgrades in the month of November. And Stiefel is joining that pack, initiating coverage on the stock with a buy rating. Bert Subin, research analyst at Stiefel, joins us now. Bert, it's great to see you. You're a believer. You initiate with a buy here. Explain explain the call to us. Yeah, great. Thanks, Thanks so much for having me. Um, I think our call is pretty simple. So if you look at what happened coming out of the pandemic, its production was super challenged. The supply chains rebooted really slowly. Um, and people have been sort of grappling with where Boeing was going to shake out of production. Uh, now, as we head into 24, um, you know, our view is that there's really nothing structural that, you know, that's, that's going to weigh on Boeing. And, and we think they're going to get back to, to much better production numbers. As that happens, you know, you're going to see free cash flow skyrocket um, and ultimately um, you know, we think we're getting to this mid-cycle stage, which which tends to be when when Boeing and its suppliers do really well. So, you know, November was a great month. Um, you know, we we came out yesterday right at the tail end of it, um, but we still think there's upside here, and and I think a lot of that's going to be driven as, uh, you know, as the delivery rate both on their inventory and and the new production starts to go up in, in early 24. Hey, Bert, for those who don't follow the the industry closely, can you explain to us sort of how the you, you talked about these types of companies doing well in mid-cycle, right? So obviously we've already seen a surge in demand for air travel, commercial air travel this year. It seems to be slowing at the margins, at least as we look into next year. But sort of where do plane orders sit? How does the timing of plane orders work when we see that kind of surge? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, demand is fantastic. And so the reason for that is, if you look at what happened over 2020, 21, 22, it was just really sort of slow delivery of planes. And you saw the age of the average fleet stretch out quite a bit. Uh, Boeing is out here, you know, I was at the Dubai Air Show recently and, and, and they booked a, a ton of new orders there. And those new orders are really gonna be fulfilled in the 2030s. So when you think about what Boeing and Airbus are doing today, it's, you know, they're trying to deliver aircraft that were, were contracted years ago. Um, and so I, I don't think you can correlate it as much with what you see on sort of the day-to-day -day side for the airlines. Um, and, you know, just as an aside, I, I think air travel demand is actually going to be quite healthy next year. You get a little bit of improvement on the corporate side. 
Um, and then I would imagine you'll get sort of a reacceleration in, in, in leisure as we go into spring and summer. So those things will matter as you think about new orders, because ultimately the airlines are going to need to produce their own free cash flow uh, to ultimately purchase these aircraft. Um, but as long as the outlook, I think, remains OK, uh, given the age of the average fleet, you know, there's going to be quite a bit of demand to, to replace older aircraft. And Bert, you know, you look at this stock, it, it, it's enjoyed a, a nice pop here, Bert. I mean, it's up about 25% in the past month. What are the, the key catalysts that you think are ahead? Yeah, that, that is a great question. It, it really took off pretty quickly. Um, I think what we're really going to be watching is November and December deliveries. October uh, data was pretty weak. Um, Boeing is talking about getting to sort of 375 to, to 400 roughly on the 737 this year. And so we'll be watching to sort of see where it falls in that range. Uh, but, you know, really, I think it's as you think out into early 24 and, and you start seeing announcements, perhaps from the supplier cohort, about what Boeing and Airbus are asking them to get ready for. And if we start to see those rate breaks, particularly on the 737 MAX, go higher, I think ultimately, um, you know, that's going to be the catalyst people are looking for. But as you noted, you know, it was a great November. Um, and there's going to be, you know, some people starting to get, you know, curious about ultimately what's the next data point. And so I think the next thing to look for is the next couple of weeks we'll get um, we'll get November deliveries. Um, Bert, I think we also have to acknowledge that Boeing might have had a great November, but it's it's coming off a tough couple of years to say the least, right? Down for the past three years, and even more recently with its supply chain issues with Spirit Aerosystems had some quality control problems. How confident are you that, that QC problems are squarely in the past uh, for Boeing and for Spirit, for that matter? Yeah, I think we're getting closer. I think part of the problem that, you know, even Spirit's talked about is, you know, they lost a lot of good skilled labor during the pandemic and, and they had to replace that with, uns, you know, less skilled labor. And so that's been a process. So labor's been a piece of it. Materials were a piece of it. You heard about aluminum and, and other metals. Um, and then ultimately just re-standing up a lot of the smaller suppliers was a piece of it. People forget, you know, it's over 600,000 parts that go into a 737 MAX. And so a lot of things have to go right to, to, to ultimately get everything on, on the same page. Um, so I think that on the spirit side, we're probably done seeing those quality control issues. Um, first, we had the vertical fin and then the bulkhead pressure side. Um, they brought in Pat Shanahan, longtime Boeing exec, um, seems to be doing all the right things so far. And, and, and that was certainly an issue that was plaguing Boeing and it, it seems to be alleviating. So I think as we get into 24, it'll be more about sort of where the production numbers go versus sort of dealing with problems, which is sort of how you characterize 23. And Bert, you know, so you initiate here with a buy, but just for our, our listeners here, what are, what are some risks to that call, Bert? You know, it, as you think through it is, it, is it labor, supply chain? Is it the economy? How, how do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think honestly, the things to to watch um, is, is probably threefold the way we're looking at it. Um, Boeing has a pretty high exposure, at least on the wide body side, to the Middle East. So if we were to see a sustained decline in oil prices, you know, let's say down to sixty dollars or so, and if it stayed there, you would get a little concerned about sort of how many billions of dollars governments over there could spend on aircraft. So that would be one thing that could potentially be an issue. Uh, U.S.-China relations, I think, is something we're always watching. Uh, I think the good news is Boeing's order book from China is actually quite small. It's around 5% of the order book. So maybe there's some upside, ultimately, as you think out to building new orders. Um, and I think the last thing is probably labor. Um, they have IAM renegotiation coming up in the second half of 24. And clearly, I'm sure you guys have covered you know pretty in-depth what we've seen on the labor side in recent months. So if, if that you know, continues as we think further out into 24, you know, that could be that could be a challenge, at least on, you know, sort of giving away some of the profits that otherwise would go to shareholders. Bert, thanks so much for your perspective. Really appreciate it. Have a great weekend. Thanks for having me. Earlier this year, President Biden embraced Bidenomics, the term many news outlets use to describe his economic policies. But recently, some have noticed the president may be distancing himself from that term. Longtime user of the word Bidenomics, Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman, is here with us now. I mean, the branding doesn't seem to be working, doesn't seem to be going over well with voters. So I guess he's just getting rid of it. That seems to be the case. I've been writing about the week in Bidenomics ever since he became president, and I'm going to continue to use it, and I think the press will continue to use it. But NBC News adroitly noticed that the word Bidenomics has not appeared in a Biden speech since November 1st, um, and that coincides with the uh, the fact that voters seem to think Bidenomics is a failure. Um, uh, so maybe Biden kind of feels like, hey, 
maybe I want to take my name off this thing so people don't associate me associate me so much with high inflation uh, and declining paychecks in real terms. Um, but uh, you know, but we, we've been talking about this for a long time. Biden's approval rating sank as inflation uh, went up and spiked in 2022. But now that inflation has come down, Biden's approval rating hasn't budged. It has stayed right down. I mean, it is all, it is basically as low right now at about 38 or 39 percent as it was uh, last summer when inflation peaked at 9 percent and gasoline prices hit five dollars a gallon. Gas is now around 3.25 a gallon. Inflation down to 3.2 percent, but Biden is still at 38 percent. So. Um, his idea that he has a lot to brag about with the economy, and he's going to call it Bidenomics, apparently not so much. And Rick, I'm going to completely uh, switch gears here, Anya. I want to get your take on these headlines I've seen about uh, Governor DeSantis and sort of these the, the tensions here with the super, ba- super PAC supporting his campaign as a student of politics, Rick. just want to get your take on that. Well, the DeSantis campaign is just going down. I mean, that, that seems very, very clear. Uh, at the beginning, uh, I think some Republicans thought he had a real fighting chance of actually displacing Donald Trump, not just being uh, a distant number two to Donald Trump, but actually being Trumpy without the baggage. And he has just completely failed to catch on with voters. Um, he is not a warm and fuzzy guy at all. He seems standoffish and he's just gotten no traction. And now Nikki Haley is the one who's getting all the attention, more money's flowing to Nikki Haley. So uh, what seems to be happening in the DeSantis campaign is what often happens when campaigns kind of go down in flames, which is everybody starts blaming everybody else, people start to bail. So we're getting word today that his main, uh, the main super PAC uh, associated with his campaign, um, the director of the super PAC is leaving. DeSantis, people are blaming the super PAC. Um, the super PAC doesn't run the campaign. The, the candidate runs a campaign, and while they're, you know, that legally they're not allowed to uh, to talk to each other, the campaign and the super PAC. Oh, I think everybody thinks that that's pretty much of a joke. Uh, they sort of speak to each other uh, in sign language, if you will. Um, but uh, what really is happening here is the DeSantis campaign is just failing. We're gonna see another debate. So DeSantis is going to be on the stage for another Republican debate coming up soon. Um, but we got the Iowa caucuses coming up in January. Um, and at that point, we'll see if DeSantis has any staying power, but he's completely underperformed expectations. Was there any upside to the Gavin Newsom debate, Rick? <laughs> uh, I, I, pro- I guess a little bit. So I don't know what Gavin Newsom had, had to gain from this. I mean, he was on a hostile turf with a uh, debate hosted by Fox News and apparently giving DeSantis some advantages, including a friendly host, uh, Sean Hannity, who has said he's to the audience, he's a conservative and he favors DeSantis. Um, for DeSantis, I guess he got to appear on the screen with uh, just a, one other person instead of you know five, as it has been in the, bay, with the debates, which maybe will now be down to four, uh, maybe even get smaller than that. But when you're um, failing, um, there's really no amount of publicity that does you any good. So does did this make him any more likable or boost his standing among Republicans, including Fox News workers? I doubt it. Um, and I'm not even sure he won the debate. I mean, most of the sort of reviews I've seen say, yeah, it was a draw and not it's really great to be anybody. Rick Newman, I always love having you. Thank you, buddy. Have a great weekend. See you guys. You too. And coming up, activist investor Nelson Peltz's proxy fight with Disney. Going to break down how Peltz could possibly get the board seats he wants. It's coming up next.
Activist investor Nelson Pelt is fighting for more seat time. The Disney board is coming after Disney reinstating a cash dividend and bringing in James Gorman, chairman and chief executive officer of Morgan Stanley, and Sir Jeremy Derrick. For more on Pelt's proxy fight with Disney, we bring in Charles Elson, founding director of the Weinberg Center for Corporate Governance at the University of Delaware. Sir Charles, good to have you. Um, let's start there. What do you make of Mr. Peltz's campaign and his odds of winning here, Charles? you think he gets what he wants? He's got a nice shot, and he's not trying to take control of the company, number one. The company has had some, obviously, performance issues, number two. The company has had some governance issues, number three. And the company has had uh, governance issues for many, many years. And governance business, uh, almost more than 20 years ago, they were uh, sort of center stage of uh, problematic governance. And uh, it's a history. It's like a very, very long Disney movie that doesn't <laughs> seem to want to end. Uh, you know, his actions, uh, the, the action of the board appointing a successor who failed, uh, the return of Mr. Iger, the return of Mr. Iger who found the successor uh, to find a new one, and then the news that Mr. Iger wouldn't be leaving for a, a long time, at least through 2026, and uh, with a board that's been viewed as very tight with Mr. Iger. And the question is, what kind of oversight is going on? And that is that is a perfect recipe for a, uh, a reasonable shot at a successful proxy contest. Charles, people know who Pelts is. Yeah, and Charles, if this is a, is a movie, I don't know who's the princess and who's the wicked witch, or if we, if we take that uh, analogy too far. But So clearly here, you believe Pelts has an argument. What does it take? What steps does he need to take to be successful with the proxy battle? Well, he has. he's joined with another very large investor as well. They've kind of, sort of linked arms, if you will, in this. He's successful. He's going to have to win over the big institutions, uh, the Vanguards, the Black Rocks, you know, who own significant amounts of the company's stock. And that's always not the easiest thing. However, he's got the right ingredients. Uh, he's seeking board representation, not control of the company. So the focus is not about him. It's about them. He's got the, uh, the company has performance issues, uh, and uh, it's affected the stock. Uh, obviously, he's having somewhat of an impact because you suddenly saw a new director announced, Mr. Corman from Morgan Stanley. And you don't do that unless you're concerned that he may have a good shot. And uh, in fact, he may very well. Again, you've got the classic ingredients for governance or questionable governance and for performance over, you know, uh, 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 at, a, at a, the bot succession is really kind of the classic. I mean, how in the world? If you brought someone who got you lost in the woods to begin with by appointing a successor uh, is expected to get you out of the woods that they got you lost in by finding someone else. And then once they got there, they said, well, gee, maybe I'm not going to leave for a while. It's a very odd situation. Peltz has a good argument on at least getting a look-see look into the board by getting a candidate or two onto that board and giving visibility to he and, and any allies as to what's going on, and the idea is that pressure will create greater accountability on the part of the managers uh, of the company, Mr. Iger, obviously, particularly, uh, given what I think he argues is it's too close a relationship between Iger and the board. How, Charles, how much of a distraction do you think this is for, for Iger? He already has, I mean, plenty on his plate, ESPN, streaming, linear TV. How much of a distraction is it, Charles, do you think? Oh, it, it, it's a big one. Uh, I mean, in a proxy fight, you're going to have to travel all over the place, meet the large investors. Uh, there'll be proxy recommendations by the large proxy advisory services that you have to deal with. Uh, and you're going to have to spend a lot of time and a lot of money on it. Uh, it's, a, it's a big distraction, which is why typically you try to avoid this at all costs, because it's not just uh, time away from your job. It's time spent on this. And usually it's going to be pretty negative. I mean, Mr. Peltz is not going to say, you're doing a great job. I'm just here to, you know, to give you support. He's saying you're doing a lousy job, more or less, and I need to get in. And so you're on the defensive, and it takes time and attention away from attempting to turn around the business. But again, it, it, it's, it's of the company's own doing. It's not Mr. Peltz's fault. It's the company that set up this, this, this performance issue slash governance issue that attracted this. That's all. 
And it's interesting that you mention it's not as though they're saying he's doing a great job because Elliot took an, another stake in another company this week, Philip 66, and there they actually praised the CEO, and it seems like a much more uh, friendly endeavor there. Um, there's been some reporting on that front that Peltz and Iger, that there's a personal element to all of this, which is that then, is there a risk that for shareholders that this is all going to turn south because there's sort of emotion in this? There's always emotion in a proxy fight. You know, you, you never like the other person or agree with the other person, and they don't particularly like you. That's why you got to a proxy fight. If you got along, then they would invite you on the board, which didn't happen here. Uh, Peltz has had many successes. He's had a few uh, non-successes. But again, the ingredients are, are, are all here. And again, this is a company that's had governance you know, disputes for many, many years. It goes all the way back to Michael Eisen. Uh, and so it's not as though you say Disney and people think, oh, good governance. You say Disney and people think Eisner, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, it just it, it, the, the brand name Disney, which is great for movies uh, in the governance biz, it sometimes signals uh, 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 governance that causes concern. And that's the problem that Mr. Iger has. All right. Story we're going to keep following closely. Charles Elson, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Good to be with y'all. And coming up, a ban on TikTok in the state of Montana is now on hold. I'm going to tell you why it's after the break.
Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. Right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Mester Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there's more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance. A ban on TikTok in the state of Montana is now on hold. A U.S. federal judge in the state temporarily blocking the ban, claiming it's unconstitutional and an overstep of state power. Here to break down more on Montana's legal battle against TikTok and what happens next, Yahoo Finance's Alexis Keenan. So what does happen next? What's the deal? Well, the case goes forward. Mm. This is a decision along the way in a case that is already in the Montana District Court, a federal court. So this, though, was the first time that a state government has ever applied a TikTok ban across the board for the general public, okay? And that makes it really different from the bans that we've already seen. And look, there are many that are already in places. This isn't new. There are the federal government. There are 25 plus states across the country that have put bans in place for government employees with their government devices. And that's something, that's the type of reach that the governments can have. But this ruling, it temporarily blocks this ban. It was supposed to go into effect on January 1st. And so it's a win for the plaintiffs. These were TikTok users, some of them arguing that their livelihoods were based on TikTok. They sell their wares and their services on TikTok. So they're really concerned about it going away there. So there were 380,000 Montana TikTok users users on a monthly basis across the country also win arguably for these folks the 150 million monthly TikTok users in the country and by the way if you do the math that's 45 percent of the entire country um, oh. so also arguably a big win too for big tech uh, the Chinese government the concern was here the reason why this this law ever made it across the board and signed into law is concerns the same ones that the federal government has had in, in that the Chinese government because it has ultimate authority of ByteDance, the parent company of TikTok, that the government would then use it to spy on Americans and use it to access very sensitive data on Americans using the app. Mm. And, and Alexis, just kind of a broader question here too. We know, you know, the U.S. government had reportedly been um, talking with TikTok about addressing these national security concerns. Any progress there that we know of? Yeah, so I've reached out to the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, and I have not heard back from them. But what has been reported throughout this year is that they were in negotiations with the U.S. federal government to try to find some common ground with TikTok, with ByteDance, to find a place that would make both uh, parties happy that the app could potentially still be in place here, but with some protections. Some of the things that were floated uh, reportedly were having cloud uh, servers that were walled off from outside of the United States. Also, uh, we know that in the past there was that failed executive order that President Trump had signed that was asking for the company to divest its U.S. entity so that it would be in the entity of a U.S. hands. Um, also, you have some legislation that's still potentially on the table, and that could give the Commerce Department the power to ban foreign technology that poses a national security risk. Um, but guys, the bigger picture here uh, is really, this is a, a window. This ruling is a window into how courts across the country, if there are additional bans put in place on any government level, how they might go through the analysis. The, the finding here, the holding of this judge, the reason why he put this block in place and said, no, this law cannot go forward into force right now. He said it was likely a violation of Americans, Montanans, 
First Amendment rights, and you had a couple different arguments. You had the users of TikTok arguing that it was a speech violation, violating their right to expression, free expression. Then on the other hand, you had uh, TikTok arguing that they should have editorial control over what they publish. So a little bit different animals there, but in the end, the same result, saying that it likely is a violation of First Amendment. So it, it, it just shows how difficult it's going to be for social media, larger social media, uh, for their policies to be challenged and the users to use them against the U.S. Constitution. All right. Ooh. One to watch. Alexis, That's thank fine. you so much for that. You're welcome. U.S. construction spending increasing more than expected in October amid strong gains in single-family home building. However, mortgage rates above 7 percent, remaining a challenge for both builders and prospective home buyers. As the affordability crisis persists in the housing market, we're taking a look at a different approach from home buying. Here to discuss is Bruce Neelage, Kinlock Partners co-founder and CEO. Bruce, it's great to have you. Listen, we know uh, buying a home right now, Bruce, not easy. High mortgage rates, limited inventory. So I'm, I'm curious, Bruce, what it's meant for, for your business, the, the build-to-rent market. Yeah, so the build-to-rent market is probably the fastest-growing segment uh, in the housing uh, business and also in all of real estate. We are doing very well. Obviously, the tougher it is for Americans to afford a new home, we are the next best alternative. You can rent a brand-new home. Uh, give the keys back in a year or two when you're ready to purchase a home. And you know what's better than a brand new house? Uh, a brand new house at a lower price than than having to buy it, I guess, which is good for your business. Bruce, you know, as we prepare to talk for you to talk with you, and really over the past months as we've been talking about the affordability crisis, I keep coming back to the question of whether the sort of American dream of home ownership is dead effectively, and whether that's okay. You know, is it? okay for people to just rent, for example, or are they are Americans really missing out on wealth building, for example, by not being able to afford to buy houses right now? So I don't know if it's dead or dying. I just know it shifted. You know, when I got out of school, you were uh, taught, hey, buy a house, settle down, uh, start making mortgage payments, gain equity. And now things have changed. People aren't buying houses till they're 35. They want to have more experiences. And so they're putting more money into their lifestyle and not buying houses right away. So I don't know if it's dying or dead. I just know the idea of the American dream has shifted. And quite frankly, I don't think it's going back to what it was a generation ago. And Bruce, you know, the, you know Wall Street right now is betting the Fed's done hiking. Cuts are in the pipeline. We can debate when that's happening, Q1, Q4. But when that does happen, they do start cutting. What is that going to mean for your, for your business, Bruce? I mean, I think our business is robust. We're running at about a 98% occupancy, and that's in all areas that we uh, we own houses in. Industry average is about 98% too. So we've been there when interest rates for mortgages were 3%. We're there now. There's just not enough housing in America, and we're several years behind. I mean, we're millions of, uh, millions of houses behind, and it's just going to take many, many years to catch up. And uh, with these high interest rates, it's just making it very tough for people to own houses. But with our industry and what we're bringing to, uh, to America, we, we are offering a housing alternative. And that housing alternative is very attractive to, uh, to families and other folks in our country. Um, and Bruce, you mentioned, you know, people sort of see this as a starter option, right? And then they turn over the keys when they buy a house. But is the duration of occupancy lengthening now because of what's going on in the home buying market? You know, I think it is. The average uh, tenant that uh, rents a, an apartment uh, stays about two to two and a half years, where in our business is four to four and a half years. Because again, why would you move out of a brand new house after 12 months? And so, yes, we're seeing people stay longer. For the first time in my career, people are renting out of choice, not out of necessity. So people are actually making a conscientious effort they don't want to buy. Maybe they want to be mobile. Maybe they're thinking about moving to a new city. Uh, but we are we are seeing uh, the business grow and more need right now than we can fill. I mean, we're we're building houses, buying houses as quick as we can. It takes just a week or two uh, to rent uh, and lease a house right now. Bruce, um, there have also been some concerns raised about the model that you guys have put forth. And of course, you're not the only ones. You have some, you have some competitors out there, you know, about private ownership, private equity ownership is usually what's brought up of neighborhoods, the effect that that has on home values, 
um, you know, are these homes kept up in the same fashion? There are a number of different uh, concerns. How do you address those? So we're building brand new neighborhoods. We are not taking houses out of stock Got it. for any buyers. So when you're creating 100 or 200 houses, that's not taken away from the general public or the first time home buyer. We uh, own the houses. We also own the homeowners association. We're taking care of landscaping, things like that. So truthfully, our houses, our neighborhoods look a lot better than many of the neighborhoods throughout the cities we're in because we're taking care of everything versus individual owners, each one of them having to take care of the lawns, landscaping and things. And Bruce, I'm gonna get you out on this. Just look at the regions where you all are focused. Um, looks like Nashville, Bruce, Atlanta. I see South Carolina here as well. W why those markets, Bruce? And, and as you look at it, 2024, any plans to expand? So uh, our industry is primarily in the smile states. And that's from the West Coast. You look at uh, Arizona, Las Vegas, that area, down through Texas and up through the Southeast like we're in. And those are the states that are growing. Automobile manufacturing is, is uh, coming to the South. Most of the states that our folks are in uh, don't have a state income tax. Florida, uh, Tennessee, Texas. And people are moving from California. They're moving from the Northeast and the Midwest, and they need housing. And that's really where the growth uh, of our industry uh, in the future is. And that's really where the growth of the population uh, growth is in our country. Bruce, thanks so much for spending some time with us. Bruce McNeilage, I appreciate it. Coming up, more Yahoo Finance.
Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. All right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Mester Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas, and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there's more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light and space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance. We are coming off a record weekend for Thanksgiving travel, and some estimates show that consumer spending on trips is not expected to slow down. Our next guest runs a business at the intersection of travel and real estate, Timbers Resorts. It offers the ability for people to buy fractions of a vacation home. Joining us now, Timbers CEO, Greg Spencer. Greg, thanks for being here. So talk to us about what you guys are seeing in terms of demand. Uh, thank you. Uh, glad to be here. We're seeing great demand. Uh, really, uh, we saw demand accelerate through COVID. We were a safe haven during COVID. And and frankly, that hasn't stopped. It hasn't slowed down one bit. And uh, we see that that trend continuing. Even though the world has opened up, we are the world. We have properties from Tuscany to Kauai. So uh, we're seeing the benefit where, where Italy was closed during COVID, it's open now, and we're seeing the demand pick back up. And frankly, for the peak holiday seasons, we haven't seen any demand let off uh, within the, uh, the continental United States. So that's interesting, Greg, because you, you have obviously, you know, good, unique insight into the health of the consumer and the consumer has proven resilient, Greg, but you know, there, there's some caution creeping in here and, and you've heard this too, you know, higher rates, dwindling savings, um, but you know, some, some caution we've heard from some executives across all kinds of industries, but for, for you right now, you're saying you, you don't see that softening. We don't. We 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 cater to a higher end of the market anyway. Our average net worth for our owners, uh, really, we're in that 0.1 to 0.5 percent socioeconomic for our physical owners, and even for our travel guests, we're you know we only dip down to about one and a half two percent uh, socioeconomic wealth in the U.S. So you know, frankly, those folks are are you know they're still vacationing the way they always did, and and I think the difference between some consumables and what we offer, you know, we sell memories, right? And, you know, it's easy to put off a purchase if it's just you individually or you and your wife, but we really focus on the multi-generational traveler and people don't want to put off for years making memories with their grandkids or with their kids. And so uh, we've always had a resilient model, even during the global financial crisis, we're pretty resilient uh, because of the end of the market that we service, as well as the fact that we really are selling those 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 memories, if you will. Greg, um, at the same time, do people finance their purchases uh, um, that they make through Timbers? And have you seen any pressure from higher interest rates as a result? You know, we 99 percent of our transactions are cash. That doesn't mean that they're not financing, but they're they're financing through a line of credit or through some other debt mechanism. But for us, it's it's predominantly a cash purchase. Uh, I, you know, I think what we've seen is we 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 haven't really seen a slowdown in sales. As a matter of fact, last year was one of our, our top sales years. What we have seen is, is a little bit more deliberation. Uh, you know, we really don't sell price per square foot. We know what it is. But again, I come back to the fact that we're selling memories, right? And, and I think as long as we're delivering the experience, uh, you know, people are willing to pay for that experience. And, and so we haven't really seen it slow down. Our owners uh, uh, during the financial crisis were more impacted by liquidity. And since you haven't seen any liquidity events happening with, with even the rates, uh, you know, we really haven't seen a, a slowdown.
And Greg, I'm interested as we, as we head into holidays here, what's in demand? You know, what, you have a portfolio of properties. Where, where, where's demand strongest? Where do people want to head? The ski's still very strong. Uh, so uh, Aspen, Vail, Steamboat Springs, those are still uh, high demand locations. Uh, and, and Hawaii, you know, Hawaii actually had a little bit of a dip uh, at the beginning of 23, uh, but Hawaii is, is definitely uh, a market that that people are very interested in. I was in Kauai earlier this week, and uh, you know we haven't seen the slowdown as far as the demand for the peak holiday seasons. And, and and you know it gets so busy. We actually close our corporate offices over the two weeks of the holiday because you know frankly our properties are not only 100% occupied, every single room's occupied. So we really try to give the properties a break so our corporate team isn't pestering them, if you will, over the peak holiday season. So we actually do kind of staff down corporately uh, just to kind of keep the eye on the ball for the, the, the peak holiday season. Greg Spencer, Timber CEO, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Well, coming up, what to watch next week? We'll break down the stories that you need to know.
Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. All right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Investor Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas, and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there's more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You got to scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance. Time now for what to watch next week on the labor market front. The Bureau of Labor Statistics coming out with the latest jobs report in the month of November. This coming as job growth slowed sharply, remember, in October. We'll also see how the manufacturing industry bounces back in November after coming in lower than expected. Another key point to watch, of course, unemployment. Unemployment rate rising last month, the highest level since January 2022. Fed will be keeping a close eye on all the data as the central bank decides the path forward for monetary policy. And on the earnings front, investors can expect to hear from names such as GameStop, Rent the One Way, and Toll Brothers. And in the gaming space, one of the most highly anticipated video games of the decade is dropping its debut trailer on Tuesday. Grand Theft Auto 6, the long-awaited installment in the beloved Rockstar franchise, has no official release date yet, but gamers will get a taste of what's to come next. All right, that'll do it for today's Yahoo Finance Live. Be sure to come back Monday, 3 p.m. Eastern for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. Are you going to be doing a lot of gaming this weekend? I'm not anti-gaming, but I'm not a gamer. Yeah, I, I, I'm the same. I mean, yeah. There is gaming that happens inside my household. Oh, I don't doubt it. But it's not I done by it. me. All right, have a great weekend, everybody.